Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are watching from or listening from. Welcome to First Responder Friday. My name is Conrad Weaver. I'm your host for the program, and I'm so glad you have decided to join us on this Friday afternoon, maybe morning where you're at, I don't know, uh, or maybe the middle of the night. It, if you're watching from someplace like in Australia or something, you might be in the middle of the night. So wherever you are from, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. And if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, leave a message in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to know uh, where you are from and, uh, and, and who you are. And perhaps you can, if you're a first responder, put in the type of agency that you work with. That'd be awesome. Also, as we get going in the program, there's an opportunity for questions for our guests today. So leave those questions in the comments and I'll see them and we will see if we can get to them later on in the show. So as you may know, I'm the producer and director of a documentary film that's in development called PTSD 911. And we are working to tell the story about first responders who are dealing with trauma and dealing with the stressors of the job. And so that's what we've been working on for the past I guess almost past year now that I've been working on this and we launched this podcast, this show in, uh, in hopes to raise support and to raise uh, interest in the film project. But this has kind of grown into a thing now and we are now actually a live, a, a podcast, an audio podcast that's available on all these different channels. So it, it's really fun. So we're on Amazon and Google and Apple podcasts and all the different places so the audio portion of this will be posted this afternoon. So as soon as we're done here with the live show, I'll go into my editing software and we'll do the magic and we'll upload it to uh, the, the podcast platforms and you'll be able to connect uh, to those audio podcasts uh, very shortly thereafter. So but again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. If you want more information about our movie, please go to our movie website, and that is ptsd911movie.com. You can learn all about the film. You can watch the trailer, which is quite dramatic and powerful. If you haven't seen that, go there, watch it, share it, let people know about it. And you can also learn about uh, our team, our board of advisors, the people who have endorsed us, and all the organizations that are helping us make this movie and to make it possible. You can also make a donation, and that's one thing that we're really needing right now is we're just needing to raise support for this film. If you want this film made, please make a tax-deductible donation. We have a, a, an organization called the Film Collaborative who has partnered with us. They are a well-known uh, organization, nonprofit in, the, in the, the movie business who helps people like us raise money. And so you can make a tax-deductible donation. That would be awesome if you could do that. We thank you very much. So we have a very special guest today. And you, if you are in the 911 dispatch world, you've probably heard of Tracy Eldridge. Tracy, I'm going to unmute you here. Welcome to First Responder Friday. Thank you so much. Tracy, I'm going to unmute you. I don't hear that often. <laughs> 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 is it usually the uh, the opposite? It, it is, it is, and I'm oh, sure some well, of my friends yeah. will will chime in there. But sometimes I have good things to say. <laughs> well, I am so glad that you are talking to us today. It's, Thank it's you. It's a privilege to have you on here. So, Tracy, tell me a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do. Um, I am currently the community engagement manager for public safety at Rapid SOS. We're a technology company that provides uh, location accuracy and additional data technology to 911 centers. Uh, I joined the team about four years ago after leaving my position at a 911 communication center in Massachusetts. I ran the Rochester Mass 911 center. I was there for about 20 years. And unfortunately, I had to leave um, that position and that piece of the 911 profession um, because of PTSD. Um, and my PTSD is a little different than others. You know, a lot of folks will, will walk out because of the calls and, and the trauma from actually doing the job. Um, my story is a little bit different, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But um, mine was caused by, by certain people in, mm. in leadership, um, and one in particular that kind of ripped off a Band-Aid um, for some stuff in my past that I, ha I had thought had healed. And once that Band-Aid was opened, it opened Pandora's box. And um, I'm also a firefighter and an EMT, a call firefighter EMT. Uh, so 
I respond from home when I can uh, to calls in our community on the fire department. But I'm I'm a huge advocate for mental health, uh, primarily 911 because that's where I'm familiar and and live. And a lot of times the 911 folks are kind of left out mm-hmm. of that understanding. Like, well, but you're just taking the calls. You're not seeing this stuff, but. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how they, they do see the stuff and yeah, they absolutely. see it over and over and, again. You know, as I've gotten into the research for this film project and, and talking to many, many, uh, call takers and mm-hmm. dispatchers, it's, it's a huge problem. And as we, as we know, as you know, personally, and, uh, but you know, going back to the thing where you said leadership, mm-hmm. the traumas from, and I've heard that from other agencies as well. And, you know, agencies that I won't mention, but even right now, there's a, an issue with an agency that, that I'm aware of where there's, you know, leadership issues where the, the rank and file, they want to go to a a more fixed uh, schedule, you know, but the leadership says, nah, we're going to keep, keep you, know, you messing you guys asleep up by making you work different shifts, you know, every week. And, and you know, these law enforcement officers are, well, you know, I have two hours of sleep and I'm barely staying awake in my patrol car. Right. You know. But leadership says, ah, oh, no, forget it. So here's traumas that are brought on, not just by the the job, but by the leadership. Yeah, and in I'm a huge advocate now for leadership stuff. I've I've put so many different tools in my toolbox, and we'll get into those. But I've put so many tools in my toolbox, um, and and one of them is is really trying to get folks doing more leadership classes in in different ways, like looking at leadership in in a different way, um, individualized leadership. Because the way that I look at it is, you know, this person who had a huge responsibility to to support me and encourage me and lead me actually did the exact opposite. And and it was from one incident and then everything changed. So everything was amazing and then it wasn't. And, you know, folks don't realize that they as a leader have such an awesome responsibility to the people that are under them. And when they have headaches because they can't stay full staffed or, you know, their morale is low, it's like, might be time to look in the mirror and see what's happening from the top down. Mm-hmm. So what happened with you in your in your case? How did you deal with what what were some of the symptoms? What were some of the things that you were dealing with on a personal level that said, hey, you know what? I have a problem here. I need to get some help. <laughs> well, the, the irony was um, I teach one of the part time things that I do is I teach for the public safety group. It's a dispatcher training company. And I wrote a class probably 10 years ago. And the title of that class is How to Save a Life, Yours. Hmm. Hmm. (laughs) And it was for telecommunicators. And I talked about all of the really bad habits that they had and we had. um, Lack of sleep, sitting for too long, eating horrible things, stress, negativity, adding more positivity. And PTSD was in there. And at the time, I would speak about PTSD to the level of this is what it is. This is what you look at. Um, this is what you look for. And if you see those things, you need to get help. But that was the extent. Um, so during the process of when I started shifting from being somebody who was talking about PTSD and becoming a, you know, somebody that is exhibiting signs of PTSD, I was the carpenter whose house wasn't finished. Hmm. I was the plumber with a leaky faucet. I knew exactly what I had to tell everybody else, but in my own world, I was doing this. Like, nope, I'll be fine. I, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. What um, was the disconnect there? How, how, you know, why did you have those blinders on that you were like, you know, I'm just going to push forward and not take care of this? Uh, honestly, because how could I be telling other people how to take care of themselves if I couldn't myself? So was right? it kind of like a, you know, your, it, it's a stigma, right? It's a stigma of saying I have a problem. Stigma and I would feel like a hypocrite, right? Mm. Like, oh, I'm telling you to get help, but but I'm avoiding and not looking at these things. And and honestly, you know, I had had a lot of challenges in my life for, for you know, many of us do have a lot of challenges. Back in 2009, 2010, I had a horrible battle with Lyme disease, which caused, uh, you know, depression. I was in bed a lot. I wasn't in my life. And then it was almost like PTSD did the same exact thing. It, it was like a mirror of it. Mm. And um, so for me, once that shift happened, once the incident happened where um, this particular 
the, the person that was the manager over me at the time. And it wasn't somebody in public safety. It was somebody in a government position. Mm. So I was a department head and I answered to uh, a leadership in, in our town government. And he had told he had told me that I couldn't do something anymore that I had been doing for years. And then he was turning on my telecommunicators and wanted me to kind of go against them. And, and that is not what I was. I wasn't going to do that. I, I'm born and bred. I bleed gold. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, when I stuck up for myself, which, again, was a piece in my life that when I would stick up for myself in certain situations, there would be consequences. And I had an abusive ex-husband um, that. If I stuck up for myself, then the consequences weren't good. So I, I would, obvi I would uh, a lot of times avoid sticking up for myself. And I did in this particular situation. And it was the beginning of the end for me in my career. So for three years, the symptoms that started were first and foremost, just, just being very emotional and anxious. I was just very anxious about everything. I was anxious already like I had some anxiety issues but it got to the point where I was starting to be afraid of everything um I was hypersensitive the 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 biggest description I could describe is I I felt like my nerves were on the outside of my body and that anything any sensory thing whether it was a repetitive noise or a loud noise um a repetitive motion. Like I remember my daughter sitting next to me and she was picking her fingernail. Like she was doing something with her hand and it was like a tapping motion. And I just turned and I, I snapped at her and she was like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. Like, and then, then I started with nightmares and these nightmares that I was having, they weren't. So as a 911 dispatcher, I dealt with hundreds of motor vehicle accident calls. And then as an EMS responder, fire and EMS responder, I've, responded to hundreds of nine, uh, motor vehicle accident calls. And what ultimately shifted for me was I kept having these dreams of me being in an accident, but the scenario was different every time, but the result was the same. I couldn't get out of the car. Hmm. So the car was on fire. I couldn't get out. The car was mangled. I couldn't get out. The car was underwater. I couldn't get out. And I would wake up flailing and kicking and screaming and, you know, fighting and, and, I started realizing like there's something more to this. Then the symptoms of avoidance started. I started avoiding the town hall. Mm -hmm. Like I would drive past to go to work and I would physically feel ill, ill. And I would get the sergeant to go pick up my um, payroll and the mail. And I'd get the chief to drop off, you know, things at the town hall. And I didn't even realize I was starting to avoid that place. Mm. And then that particular manager came into the dispatch center one day and wanted me in the conference room and he became extremely aggressive. And that was the moment where the bandaid was ripped off and a flood of memories and feelings and emotions came back. And that was it. That was it. Mm. I became a very, very, very different, withdrawn, sad, broken person. And, and it wasn't until I visualized in mid daylight, one of my police officers getting hit by a car in front of me that I realized I, I have to go get the help that I need. I, mm -hmm. I, it's time. What's the first thing you did when you made that decision to get help? Um, I had a conversation with my husband and I had a conversation with my kids, um, because it was important for me for them to understand that I'm not just being mean. I'm not, I'm not being short with you uh, just because I'm a miserable person. Uh, there's something wrong. And the, the most awesome thing was they knew there, there was something wrong and they were 100% supportive of anything that I needed to do. So I started immediately looking for a program um, and I couldn't necessarily find one. And then I went to work one day and the straw that broke the camel's back, like I was done. There was an incident that happened. I came home. I told my husband, I was like, I'm done. I got to go. I, I, I can't, I can't stay here. And in my mind, I was like, if I leave, then everything's going to be okay. And all of this stuff is going to stop and I'm not going to be stressed anymore. And I'm not going to be, you know, showing these symptoms. I was so wrong. <laughs> So wrong. Um, and I, so I made the decision to leave the 911 center. And three days later, 
Now I'm not even making this up. Three days later, Michael Martin from Rapid SOS showed up in my 911 center and offered me the job I have today. And I was so nervous because it was different. It was new. Like, but I knew I had to go and this, everything was happening <clears throat> exactly the way that it needed to. So when I went from, <clears throat> excuse me, when I went from being in the 911 center to Rapid SOS, um, it was different. And I was doing different things. I didn't feel like I was saving lives at the moment. Like, like I, I lost that drive in a different way that, that I, my drive to serve and help. And, and I went from critical moments to sending out emails and it was, it was challenging for me. Um, and I went to Michael Martin and, and my boss at the time, Reinhardt, and I said, I need to go get help. I said, I'm not, I'm not thriving here in the beginning, in the first four months. Um, I know it appears that, that I am, I'm trying, um, but I'm, I'm not in a good place. And so I, I committed to sending myself to a program in Sedona, Arizona. And while I went there and it was, it helped on the surface, it didn't get deep where the stuff was really rooted. And it wasn't until about a year and a half after that. So I came back from Sedona. I was refreshed. I was ready. And anybody that knows me knows that I, I took the 911 world by storm. I did so much to make sure that what we were going to do for location accuracy with 911, I was going to make happen because I know what it felt like to sit there and not find a 911 caller. And I knew that folks leaving the seat and not having found somebody was messing with them in a big way. So I was blessed to be given the opportunity to have a life where I could save lives on both sides of the call. Mm -hmm. So the caller with our location and then my advocacy for mental health and 911. And then I fell again. I started struggling again. And, you know, different triggers were coming up. And I'm like, why is this happening? And then I started doing EMDR therapy, mm -hmm. eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Um, and that saved my life, hmm. literally saved my life. So for the uninitiated, how does that work? For the what? For the, for the people who don't know what EMDR is, how does okay. that, what, I mean, what is it and how does it work? Yeah. So, um, it's magic juju. That's the, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't fully know how it works, but this, this is what I can explain in my terms. So number one, when we, um, when we have a trauma, a lot of times we're not going to feel it in that moment. Our brain protects us. It's like poop, abort. It shuts down. Mm -hmm. It it you know decides that I'm not I'm not going to deal with that right now. We'll go ahead and deal with that later. So it throws it back somewhere in your brain, and you don't you you don't deal with it. You don't feel the feelings. You don't talk through what you're going through at that moment, and and now you've got this mess that's just building up behind you. And to me, it truly felt like I had this lightning bolt that was just bouncing around in me that it couldn't get out. And for EMDR, it forced me to go back to the places that I avoided hmm. and to feel them and to deal with them. And that scares the life out of people. Like, uh -uh, I, nope, mm -mm, I don't want to go back there. Hmm. It's ugly. It's scary. It's icky. But sometimes we have to because hmm. until you – you know, I, I, well, I know this is silly, but with my daughter last night, we watched Paranorman and he talked about how these ghosts couldn't pass over until they, you know, resolve these issues. And I thought to myself, I'm like, what an amazing way to explain EMDR. <laughs> if you don't work, if you don't address those issues, if you don't face them, you don't head them on, then they're just going to be sitting in there and every time something triggers and triggers are not like what you think. It's not like, it's not like in the scenario with my boss at the time where he got aggressive and he stepped towards me and he slammed his hand on the desk. And like, that was a familiar behavior to me from an abusive relationship, right? That's a normal trigger. That's something like, yeah, duh, that's a trigger. But then there were times where it was like, I would smell garlic and lose my mind. Like mm. I would, I would be insta cranky. So digging through these things. So what EMDR actually does is it, it 
when you work with your therapist, there's two ways you can do it. And I'm, I have ADHD, so I couldn't, I wasn't successful with the first one. I had to do the second version. So the first one that is most common is you will set up a timeline or a list of events with the person you're going to do the treatment with. And you're going to go back to those events. And while you're going back to that event and you're starting to think about it, they're going to move either a light, their finger, something in front of you kind of rapidly, and you're going to follow it with your eyes. And again, I can't explain how it works or why it works, but I know that it's using bilateral stimulation and it's basically blurring the emotional charge that's attached to that event. Well, I had a hard time staring at this light thing and I'm like, oh, those new curtains. Did you, did you cut your hair? So the way that I do it is I have these little paddles that I hold in my hand that are connected to a little box that my therapist has and they vibrate back and forth. So it's doing the same thing. It's, it's causing feeling on both sides of the body while I'm going back to these icky places. And you don't have to talk. You don't have to talk. So sometimes I'll come out and I'll be like, whoa. Whoa, that just brought me to, whoa, that just brought me to a place that I didn't even know was an issue for me. But that explains why that, that, and that are causing these severe anxiety or panic attack times. So I have done EMDR probably close to 60 times. And it's really worked for you? 100%. Yeah. 100%. I've I've heard so many other stories like that of people who have uh, experience EMDR that has just really fixed them. I mean, in a way, fixed them. You yeah. Know, fixed the problem, and which is amazing. Uh, it took my anxiety level. Like at the time when I went to go do it, and I said, and and the thing with with tools, the way that I look at it is, I had heard about EMDR in a class with Jim Marshall from the Nine One Training Institute. At the time where I was in my darkest place, mm-hmm. and but I wasn't ready. Like I didn't have the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. to even process it. It's like, here you go. Here's treatment. Do this. You'll feel better. I couldn't even comprehend what was happening. And in right around that time was when I actually left the center. So I was thinking in my mind, again, everything's going to get better. Just leaving the situation isn't going to Mm -hmm. necessarily make it better. And um, so it was about a year and a half in where I said, all right, um, yeah, I'm having thoughts that are not good thoughts. And, and, you know, there were thoughts that I was going to take my own life because I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And I said, all right, well, here's, I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to find a new tool to put in the toolbox because I have a lot of work to do. And, you know, that for me, I went and I found that therapist who does it and I walked in, I said, I don't want to do the talk thing. Like I've done the talk thing for years and years and years. And that's not obviously doing what I need to do. Mm -hmm. I went to a program in Sedona, buried some surface stuff there. That's great, but I want to do EMDR. And so let's get this thing started. And within the first, so we set up the timeline and, and where, so I actually started, I went back to the moment where my boss turned on me because everything forward went back to that. So I started there, I moved forward and then I'm like, all right, well, I'm feeling pretty good. This is great. And then another trigger happened and I was like, oh, wait a minute. There's a difference between a trigger and I'm just being miserable. And so I texted my, (laughs) I had come home from um, an event My husband and I and a couple of other instructors, we started an explore program for fire and EMS 14 to 18 year old kids. And we got the firefighter of the year award. It's supposed to be the best day ever, right? We go to the event. It's wonderful. Feel on top of the world. Come home. I walk into my bedroom. I walk out. I come back into the living room. I sit down next to my husband and he's eating watermelon. And I look at him and I'm like, what are you eating? And he's like, watermelon. And I'm like, it sounds like you're eating a bucket of bolts. Like what is like, (laughs) and I was just like, and now I'm lashing out at him. I'm lashing out at my daughter and I'm like, Ooh, something's not right. So I texted my therapist. I'm like, do you have any appointments coming up? And she's like, yeah, I had a cancellation at seven tonight. Can you come in? I'm like, yep. And I'm coming in hot. (laughs) So (laughs) I went in and I said, I don't know what happened. Um, But we, so we started at the beginning of the day. And as we progressed, 
I got to the precise moment where there was a trigger that mm. had brought up some trauma from childhood mm -hmm. and I was blown away. Mm. There was no way that in my, like just my regular mind, I was going to be able to comprehend that that connected to that. Right. It, it's so pretty I, cool. I, I want to go back to what got you interested, involved in, in 911 and how'd you get started in, in public serve in, in, in public safety? Yeah. So, um, when I was younger, I wanted to be a nurse and from a young age, I, I wanted to be a nurse. I, I, I knew I wanted to serve. I am in, I do a lot with disc personality. I am a people person all day long, like people, 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 um, <laughs> very challenging task stuff is, is for me, but people from a young age. And, and I was always the person that would want to take care of everybody like that mom kind of role. But when I got into high school, um, I went to a vocational school, went into the nursing program to, in the, the vocational school, and I wasn't exposed to emergency medicine. We were going to nursing homes and mm -hmm. we were on the geriatric floor at the hospital. And not that I don't love our older generation, it just wasn't filling my cup. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. like I needed adrenaline and I didn't know that at that age. So my dad, when I went to go to college, he was like, you should be a police officer. You know, police officers, they make good money. And he was a police officer. My dad was a Boston police officer for a long time. And uh, so he's like, you should be a police officer. And I'm like, all right, maybe I'll look into that. That sounds kind of cool. So I got my bachelor's degree in criminology and I went looking for police jobs. And in our area, we're a very rural community. So our police departments were not civil service. It was more or less, you walked in, talked to the police chief, like, hey, are you hiring? And I did that. And when I went to Freetown, they um, had said, well, we're not hiring for police, but we're hiring dispatchers. And I'm like, well, what's a dispatcher? And she said, well, you answer 911 calls and, and you dispatch police and fire and, and EMS. And I'm like, oh, so you're going to pay me to tell people where to go? <laughs> All right. And then um, my first night on it was quite an ordeal and there was a firearm involved and the police were out chasing somebody in the middle of the night. And I, I realized two things that night. One, I didn't want to be a police, police officer anymore because I was a little hairy and scary. And two, if somebody was going to pay me to talk for a living, that's where I needed <laughs> to be. <laughs> I found my spot. So, yeah, that's how I got there. Wow. And, and how did from those first moments over the, what did you say, 20 years you were, yeah. did you, how, how did you change as a, as a person? Um, besides the, the traumas of, of dealing with leadership that, you know, weren't so good. The biggest change for me was I became extremely controlling. So I grew as a, as a leader. I, I was very adamant about making sure my folks were taken care of, that they had what they needed, that, you know, a telecommunicator week, I would put them on a pedestal. Like I wanted to be the most amazing leader. But what I realized is over time, um, the need to control things became an issue. And, and I look back on that and I always apologize to my folks anytime I see them or have an opportunity. Um, and, and if I speak to it, like I am now, I'll, I'll share it with the folks I still talk to, um, is that if I could go back and say, I'm sorry, like I totally would, it, but it wasn't something that I did intentionally. It was more, I just wanted to make sure that nobody died. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very, you have to do things this way. It has to be done this way. And, and I lost sight of, of that. Um, and then once the trauma started, once, once the PTSD started, I, I became a, a non-existent um, leader. I, I was calling in sick a lot. I was avoiding going to work. When I was at work, I was in my office a lot. I was crying all the time. So, so the shift went from I was so I'm so very passionate about 911 and everything about 911 and learning and educating. I was involved at the state level with things. I was in the Mass Communication Supervisors Association. I was teaching across the country. Like I was immersed, and then I dispersed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you know, looking back at your career as a as a dispatcher, what were some of those things that you wish you would have known or learned or been taught early on? Ugh, EMDR. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I honestly, so I was a baby dispatcher in 1996 and I took the APCO 40 hour telecommunicator class um, with Peter Thomas and Brian Garrity. And they were amazing. Like they, those two and the dispatcher Joanne that I trained with, they passed their passion on to me. Like it was like their passion for 911 was amazing. But when I look back on the training, one, there wasn't a whole lot of training. (laughs) It was a very short training period. It's like, there's the phone when it rings, answer it. There's radio when they talk, talk back to it. Um, There were no standards for training. And then even as training standards came about, a lot of the classes didn't focus on mental health and wellness. And that's changing. And I'm... I'm blessed to be a part of that change because I know I'm making a difference by coming out, sharing my story and, and sharing the importance of looking at your folks and checking up on your folks. Like I wish I had checked up on my folks more. That was something that I missed. Um, I would check up on them. So don't get me wrong there. If they had a really bad call, I was in the center, maybe sending them home. Um, I was checking up on them. They knew they could come to me, but I wasn't checking up on them periodically. And what I know now, if I had the opportunity to go back and make changes, number one, any t- training before they even got close to training, we would have laid that foundation about trauma and you're going to hear things. Your ears are going to see things that your brain is never going to forget. Right. My friend Carol said that in a class and I mm-hmm. thought it was the most profound statement. Like that's the first thing I would say to a telecommunicator that your ears are going to hear uh, see things that your brain will never forget because we visualize what's happening on the scene. And then I would want to make sure that I was checking up with them regularly. How are you sleeping? How are you eating? How are you getting along with the people in your home? And while they don't have to tell you those things, it's like, I wish now I would have done that more because there were things that surfaced for a couple of my telecommunicators like seven, eight years later after an incident. Mm-hmm. And I think if I had followed up earlier, it may not have, have been an issue. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that, I mean, th- those are really personal, you know, diving deep into your personal life. How do people react to that? You know, it's like, it's none of your business or, yeah. it's, you know, they get some of that, you know, from people. Um, I think it's going to depend on the person, obviously. And that's why I do a lot with DISC. And for those that are not familiar with DISC that are listening, um, DISC is a, a, behavioral type, personality type assessment. And it's not comparable to like, what type of potato are you on Facebook, right? Like you you take these, what type of potato are you? What what type of this are you? Um, This is a a very short questionnaire. I don't even know how it does it. Um, But you, you answer these questions and it spits out who you are, in, in kind of your DNA, what motivates you, what demotivates you. Um, and some folks, so when you look at the two sides or the two big areas of DISC is, is are you people oriented or are you task oriented? Mm-hmm. And are you introverted or, and, or are you extroverted? So clearly I am an extroverted people person, but my second trait that is very close is an introverted people person. It so I like, 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 like almost the opposite of what, what, what your primary trait is, right? 100%, right? So, but either way, it's people all day long. So mm. for me, everything that I do is, is people first. Then you have the folks that are on the other side that are task, right? And they're not going to be warm and fuzzy. They are not going to want to sing Kumbaya. They're not going to want to mm-hmm. sit and talk and be emotional and sensitive and all that. But what I do think is if you know who you people are, And you can apply that type of DISC assessment or just even knowing, like, are they introverted or extroverted? Are they people or task? If they're people, they're going to want to talk. If they're task, you might have to go about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Right? So I know that if I'm dealing with somebody who is on the task side of the spectrum, if they're D D or C, I'm not warm and fuzzy. I'm not sensitive. I'm not emotional. I'm going to get right to the point. And I'm going to give them what they want. And I think that backfired on me too, is that I had a couple of folks that were on the task side that I was trying to be warm and fuzzy with. Mm. And that, that, that could be, it's almost like a battery, right? Like trying to put a battery together. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say as a, as a leader 
in, in any type of a organization, it's important to know who you're leading. No, 100%. 100%. Like that has to be the foundation. I've said to folks that, um, you know, reach out to me, I'll point to you how to get these assessments done. Because when you look at that assessment, first of all, personally, you're like, whoa, that's exactly who I am. But with this education, it also shows you where your blind spots are and where you may be challenging to other people. And one of the things that I did, um, I, I met up with uh, Coach Gord McFarlane and two, almost two years ago at just that time where I needed that other tool, right? Because things were being challenging. So I find this new tool. And one of the things that I didn't realize is me being who I am, I can be a little much for people. And for the folks that are task and, and kind of results driven folks, they don't really like being around that too much. So I would kind of become a chameleon and morph who I was in those particular situations to make sure that I was building an opportunity for a good experience. And somebody said to me one time, they're like, why are you changing who you are to suit other people? And I said, actually, I'm not. I'm not changing who I am. I'm changing how I behave. Hmm. There's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I want good relationship outcomes. And if that means that I have to walk in the room quietly, sit down and not speak until an opportunity arises versus coming in and being like, what's up, everybody? And hey, I'm here to know the difference that's going to help me with my trauma in the end. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, looking at and, and you are you've talked to you've spoken with agencies all over the country yep. and, and training and things like that. What do you see as some of the biggest or are some of the biggest challenges, especially in the, in the dispatch and 911 community? Sadly, leadership. And what I mean by that is, is again, it is. There are so many amazing leaders out there. Don't get me wrong. I, I am so close to so many leaders in the 9-1 space. Um, but I think if if we could get them to understand how much they impact what happens in their center, things might be a little bit different. Um, and then so next to leaders and, and I actually did um, a survey. So a, two years, a year ago. About a year and a half ago, I did a presentation, APCO, the National Association for one of the big associations for dispatch, had asked me to do a class in the career center from the emergency communication center to the private sector. And I just thought that was interesting. Like, why would you want to encourage people to leave? And then I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute. No, it's not necessarily that. Right. So I did a, a survey and in the survey, it was very specific to people that either left the 911 center or want to leave the 911 center. So if you're happy, you're content, you're good, you don't, please don't answer. But if you left or want to leave, please answer. And I got about 350 results. And the choices that I gave them as to why, why did you leave or why do you want to leave were this. Leadership, PTSD burnout, financial obligations, no room for advancement, and D, all of the above. So the majority of the answer was D, all of the above. Wow. Which, which included leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second highest answer right underneath it was leadership. So 53% mm. of the responses were leadership. So that was wow. there. And then, then, then after that, if you broke it down even more, it, it would be PTSD and burnout. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of John Maxwell. And yep. He's, he's often said, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership. Yep. You know, and that's so true. And when you have people in your organization who are suffering and you don't, you don't stand up for them or help them, then you have a real failure in leadership. And so what can a leader do when he or she sees someone in their agency who perhaps is suffering from post-traumatic stress or 
having some issues that like this, you know, how does a leader approach them to say, hey, you know what, maybe we need to look at getting some help for you? Um, so first you need to look at the relationship. If you're the leader and you're seeing this happen, you got to look at the relationship that you have with that person, right? So if you have a good relationship, I think it warrants a conversation outside of the dispatch center. Like, Hey, why don't we go grab some coffee or, you know, let's go grab some lunch or come in the conference room with me. If it's a good relationship, then I think it just it's starting an initial conversation. Um, the other thing is really important that is if you do have the ability to have this conversation with, with folks, don't tell them like, don't tell them what you're seeing. Like in my mind. So, um, one of my big triggers is when people tell me I'm too emotional or I'm too sensitive. That's just been a trigger my entire life. But now I know that that's my gift. <laughs> it, is, it is actually my gift, but there are a handful of people that, that don't see that as a gift. They see it as an annoying trait, right? So um, when people tell me things, so I would like you to avoid things like this. You're too anything, right? So you're, we noticed you're being too emotional. Uh, we, we, know, we noticed you're being, you know, too angry or, or things like that. Um, so that's number one. And number two, don't ever start sentences off like, you know, I know you're going to be upset when I say this, or um, please don't take this the wrong way. Because as soon as you do that, <laughs> you they're like, I'm, I'm done. Like, you're right. coming at me, you're going to tell me something I don't want to hear about myself. Um, I would recommend if I was in that situation, I would Honestly, I wouldn't start it as a, hey, let's go talk about something deep right away. I would just start little conversations like, you know, how, how are things? How are you? Um, my friend Ryan Dedman, he uh, from the 9-1 Training Institute, he talks a lot about the same, the same topic, right? So we've all been through this stuff. We're, we're sharing the information that we have. He talks about asking folks how they are, but put a gauge on it. Right. Like mm -hmm. I could walk out to my floor and be like, hey, so and so, how are you? And they're like, oh, I'm fine. Finds a four letter. When they're word, not. Right? <laughs> it really is. And I'm not going to share what Ryan's uh, acronym for fine is, but maybe you can have him on and he can yeah, explain okay, it. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, people say they're fine all the time. And, and, but we really don't know. So mm -hmm. one of the things that he has started encouraging folks to do is, is ask on a number scale, like one to 10. Like, tell me, tell me what you are. And when I first heard him say this, it was, it was funny because I was sitting next to one of my coworkers at Rapid SOS. We were at a conference. I was, you know, in, in Ryan's session and he says, ask them what they are by number. And then that way you can kind of gauge right now. Now you're forcing them to actually think about it. Like, oh, 10's mm. amazing. You know, and be a little zero. more truthful perhaps. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, you, you actually do care. Well, you know what? And I leaned over to my coworker and I said, I'm a three tapped, trapped in a tens body. <laughs> and that's who I am. Like on the outside, you see me as a bubbly, positive, you know, passionate person. But on the inside, there are times where there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And, and it, the difference for me is I can find the tools, right? Mm -hmm. So asking somebody opening up that dialogue to say you know how are you and them saying fine and be like no seriously how are you like on a scale of one to ten ten and even if they say there are seven so what's missing how do we get you to a ten well i'm not sleeping great well why aren't you sleeping great well I don't know, because maybe I'm drinking a bottle of vodka at night and I'm passing out. And then at 2 a.m., I'm waking up to this sugar high and I the demons start racing. Like, like it's it's a matter of opening up a dialogue, not being accusatory and 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 really building a relationship, I think, is is really important. And then so you have peeling the back those layers like an onion. You're peeling instead of just slicing right into the middle of it. You're peeling back those layers one at a time and they're yeah. revealing it themselves. Right. 
Yep. Yep. You're giving them the opportunity because when you start pointing stuff out to people, like that's really challenging. Like hmm. when, when you point out to me, my weaknesses, I know my weaknesses. No There's no way. That, right? yeah, we <laughs> I know my weaknesses. <laughs> I don't need you to tell me my weaknesses. Right. So yeah, that that's how I would go about it for sure. Yeah. That's really good advice. I think for anyone in any situation, whether they're a you know, a dispatcher or whatever business you're in, I think yeah. that's a great tool because we, especially we as Americans, we're so easy to say, I'm good. You know, mm -hmm. we kind of have this dialogue of, Hey, how are you? We don't really mean that question, but it's like this conversation that we always have. And we, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You know, but we're, you know, most of us are not. <laughs> and, and, and who's going to go, well, how are you? Well, I'm really crappy. Like right, there's exactly. a ton of stuff gonna... going on. You really want to listen to what I have to say right now? Pull up a chair. You want a yeah. coffee? We're going to be here a while. <laughs> and, uh, that would be like, hey, remind me never to ask you again. right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it's funny, Conrad, that you say that is, um, you know, I've had my challenges with that because I'm a people person, because I genuinely trust more than I probably should. Um, and that I, I'm an empath. So I share a lot and, and there are folks that just, they don't want to hear it. They, they don't want to hear your emotional. They don't want to hear your sensitive. They, they just don't. And it's not their fault. It's just, it's just who they are. So, you know, finding the right person to reach out to is really important too. Mm. Like if, so you ask what as a leader you could do, um, I'm going to flip that script. And yeah. and if you are, if you are a person that's sitting in the chair that's struggling or in the ambulance or the police car or the fire truck, if, if you're struggling and you see this relationship with your leader or your supervisor that you're like, they are not going to receive this very well, then maybe you talk to somebody else that you know will, because Going at this alone is extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. I, I have some amazing friends that have have been in their perspective line of work and they've struggled and they've gone to their leadership and it has not ended well. And that makes me horribly sad, horribly mm -hmm. sad. Um, and, and they're not even on the job anymore, but they're huge mental health advocates and like, it's like, yeah, I, I'm happy you're here because you're you're making a huge difference, but you shouldn't have had to be here to begin with. You should have been able to get the support that you needed. So again, where does it start? At the top. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, how do you lead up? I mean, that's a term that's been mm -hmm. used, you know, for a while. You know, how do you lead up with, with a leader that's perhaps just not aware, you know, of what, of, of the crap you're dealing with? Um. I actually just got goosebumps when you asked that question. Um, one of the things I actually have it sitting right over here. I pulled it out for some um, I'm writing a new class and I pulled it out for some data. Um, but I did the CCM program, the comm center manager uh, leadership class for for uh, dispatch. And in that class. So there were a couple of things that happened. One, that was where I first heard about EMDR Two, that's where I heard about DISC. Again, wasn't ready to, to deal with that at that time. Three, uh, they had us do what was called a 360 leadership type thing. Um, and I would highly recommend that for every leader in the 9-1 Center. Because what it's going to do is it's going to show <laughs> where your blind spots are. Mm. And I'm really sad that it was at that time. And if you remember what I, what I said is I actually left the nine ones. So I'm in this class. I mean, I'm in the CCM class and there's, you know, a week on, there's six weeks online, a week on site, six weeks online and a week on site. And between the two on sites, <laughs> I quit my job. Hmm. <laughs> so when I came back in and they're like, all right, did anybody go back and make any major changes? I'm like, <laughs> yep, I quit my job. And they're like, what? And I'm like, but I'm here. Like, I want to finish this because it's amazing and I've learned so much. But that 360, and there's other 360 leaderships. And if anybody, Mike, I'll share my contact information in, in, the, uh, in the comments. But if anybody wants to reach out for the actual name of it, there's a ton of 360 leaderships. But what this one did very specifically, and this is a way, this is a way for folks 
to feel like they're leading up, it, to feel like they're able to anonymously say, you suck as a boss right now, right? Or, you, or you're really good over here, but you're not so good over here. And what it was, was the link went to my peers. So police chief, fire chief, highway surveyor, facilities manager. So the folks that were on the same level as me, it went to my manager, new manager at the time. Um, and then it went to my subordinates. Hmm. And they answered a whole slew of questions. And again, like I, in my mind, I'm like, it's going to be good. I'm a good boss. I'm a good leader. But when I got back, when I got it back and I held it up, it was like holding up a mirror that had a crack hmm. in it. And there were things on there that I was like, Ugh. I didn't want to hear that. But I'm like, I, I can see why they said that or why that was challenging. Um, but for me, I'm a different person. If you're going to give me that feedback, I'm going to make those changes. And I didn't have the opportunity to make those changes. Mm -hmm. So I would say to be able to lead up is a lot of folks will reach out to me, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, they'll, they'll reach out to me and they're like, I'm having a hard time in my center. The morale's really hard. There's nothing I can do. There is. For me, when you say the word lead up, it means be a leader, period. Like, be the best version of yourself every day when you go in there. Don't get involved in all the negativity and the drama and the gossiping and the he said, she said and all that. Like, I would give anything to have gone back and not participated in any of that stuff. That's how you can lead up. Squashing the negativity and the chaos before it has the ability to, to spread like a cancer. Like, that's the first step, mm. right? Mm. What are some some resources perhaps you mentioned some of them what are some other resources that someone can use that they can go to or places they can they can check out to to get help or to to start that process or or to perhaps improve their leadership ability even well one they can reach out to me because i have lots of leadership classes that that i offer um and things that i work on as well outside of my role as rapid sos I have a few things that I have up my sleeves that are going to be launching as far as leadership goes, because to me, that really is the most important thing in an agency. Like if your leadership's good, your people are going to be much better for it. Um, but there are other programs out there. Um, there is a whole list, which I would definitely recommend folks checking out the dispatch lab um, is run by my friend Halcyon. And in the dispatch lab, she actually has like an ebook, a document there that has a ton of resources that are listed uh, for 911 folks. But there's a couple of places that stick out for me when it comes to just public safety in general. And one is the Onsite Academy that is located here in Massachusetts. And I don't know if anybody's talked to you about that, um, mm -hmm. but it is that it's on site. Folks go there, um, you're a first responder, you get to go. And uh, I did try to go there, but what I realized is um, it was a lot of treatment based on the actual job itself. My PTSD was from a different place in my life that was brought forward and then that Pandora's box opened. So I needed to fix that first stuff before I could fix the, the public safety stuff. Um, but utilizing any resources. When I found my therapist, I like to share this when somebody is looking like, how do I even know where to start? How do I know who, who does EMDR? So I'm going to share this little piece of information that has worked well for many. I simply went to psychologytoday.com and at the top, you put in your zip code, you go to the filter and you put EMDR under treatment type and you put PTSD and trauma. And then you're going to read through every one of the profiles that comes up. And there's going to be one that pops out at you and you're like, that's the person. And then you're going to reach out and you're going to email them and say, are you accepting new patients? This is who I am. And there is a very high likelihood they're not going to be accepting new patients because if you thought they're amazing, so does everybody, everybody else. else right? <laughs> right? So here's my suggestion for that. Don't get deflated. Don't look at it as a sign like I shouldn't be doing this. Ask that person to recommend someone. Mm. Don't go back to the list. Ask that person because that person, they flock with the people that are just like them. And that's what happened to me. And when I've shared that with folks, they, 
it's so funny. They'll, they'll come back. They'll be like, how do, how do I know where to get help? And I explain that and they do exactly that. And it happens exactly to the T so many times. And, and then the person that they were meant to be is the person who they end up with. Hmm. So what do you do today to stay mentally healthy? Um, one, I continue EMDR. I was there last week, been working through some, some stuff that surfaced. Um, Two, being aware, like I said, knowing the difference between, all right, I'm just tired and cranky and having a bad day and going, oh, wait, no, something triggered me. So being aware, um, using the tools that I have. So I have the EMDR. I have the DISC stuff. I use DISC personality profiles like you would not. I don't meet somebody and be like, I need you to fill this out. <laughs> that, that's not how it works. I've put so much time and energy into learning each and every style and how to speak to people, how to not speak to people. And, and I will be able to see who they are in the way that they're engaging with me. So using that particular tool, because if I don't do that, I'm going to take a hit and I don't, I don't want to take a hit. Um, I communicate more. That's huge. My daughter, to my family, family or- my family, my boss, you know, it's hard. It, it's hard. Like, I don't want to be labeled as somebody who's broken or, you know, can't do their job or whatever. But to have supportive leadership, my my boss, Michelle, is like, she gets me and she gets it, right? So I may have a day where I'm like, my brain isn't here. Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to do a ton of stuff today or whatever. I'm going to take a mental health day. Great. But she also knows that three days before I was probably working till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Right. So having an open dialogue with people. I have some friends that I, that I had a really good conversation with today. I was struggling with some stuff and I called them up and I, and I had this conversation because I knew that they were going to give stuff back to me that I was going to be able to take away and go, all right, I am good. I am worthy. I, I, I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm okay. Going in to the room by yourself, that's not how to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of my other like resources that was so profound in helping me was my dear friend, Carl Waggett, who has um, a podcast, had a podcast. The podcast is still available um, he does do lives on social media, but he um, is the creator and host of PTSD Bunker Gear for Your Brain. He has a way, he is out of work on PTSD um, from up in Canada. He was somebody I stumbled upon right when I was in my darkest place. When I got to that place where I had to go to Sedona, I remember sending him a picture actually in Sedona of me listening to like his first two podcasts. Um But the way he speaks about PTSD, even if you don't have it or you don't think you do, just going back and listening to his podcast and being able to identify things is is really profound. So Carl is a tool and PTSD bunker gear for your brain. So for me, the big things, my tools, EMDR, DISC and and PTSD bunker gear for your brain. So Mm -hmm. and, and surrounding myself with people who I know truly care and want to help me. And on top of everything you do with your full-time job and your training for 911, you started a podcast. I did. I did. Good for you. Thank so you. What's the podcast about and where can people find it? So um, the podcast is titled On Scene First with Tracy Eldridge. And I you can just search it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, my website should be up soon. I've been working on that. I'm very excited to be launching that. But On Scene First for me is a way to have that platform to, to be that resource for somebody else. Right. So it's not that I'm trying to do what other people are doing. It's, it's giving me a place where I can share my experiences, my voice. Um, and there's two things that, that I really talk about that I focus on and they're two random topics, but it is, um, you know, the new technology that is coming into the 91 space, because that can be challenging for folks but it's exciting and the mental health aspect of it. So when I say like, it's truly the place to go to learn how to save lives on both sides of the call, 
Like if you're not mentally taking care of yourself over here, you can't help them. Right. So having on scene first and and here's I'm going to say this and it's going to I don't know how it's going to come off. But, you know, I'm a firefighter EMT. I went, I have a bachelor's degree in criminology. My dad was a cop. I get that first responders, you know, are generally the people that are that are on the scene. However, mm-hmm. telecommunicators deserve the classification of a first responder. And if you don't think that I I'm sorry, but they truly are the first emergency personnel on the scene of the majority of emergency calls. And just because they're not there physically doesn't mean that they are not a first responder. It's mm-hmm. it's who who responds first, right? right? And and that's what they are. So for me to be able to be a voice for them, an advocate for them, um, when I came up with the name on scene first, because there's a whole bunch of first on scene things, yeah. but I wanted to pay homage to to on scene first, right? So in the dispatcher mind, they're on scene first. Mm-hmm. And in the police fire DMS, they're on scene first. Mm-hmm. So either way, this podcast is dedicated to the folks that are on scene first of any and every emergency call that's out there. So I want to provide the tools for them to be mentally healthy and to put the tools and embrace the tools. Like change is scary. And we know that change is scary. And the funniest part about it is I will listen to dispatchers, even my own dispatchers would complain about, oh, I get a sign into another computer. And it's like, yeah, but but this tool is going to save you 20 minutes of work and a lifetime of stress. Hmm. So getting folks to kind of embrace that a little bit more, that's that's my goal and that's my passion. Yeah, well, congratulations on the podcast. And I Thank encourage you. everyone to go check it out and follow it and subscribe and all that fun stuff. Yes. To, uh, to Tracy's podcast. And awesome. you will have to be awesome. my guest. So I'd be happy to. So you can talk about your amazing movie and what you're doing for first yeah. responders. Well, it's been it's amazing that it's been an hour and one minute, two minutes already. We've been on this yeah. this program since it's, it's going by so fast. And so thank you so much for what you do. Thank, thank you. Thank you for what you do for our first responders and thank you for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Conrad. I appreciate you too, my friend. Stick around. We'll be right back uh, just to sign off offline. But uh, you've been watching First Responder Friday. And my name is Conrad Weaver. And we'll be back next week for another First Responder Friday show. And uh, please check out all the different shows we have coming up in the near future. We have some amazing people that are going to be on. And we're already booking into January. So I talked to some some people uh, yesterday and today who are going to be on the show in January. So please check it out. We're also now live on on different audio podcasts. So check them out on Apple Podcasts. And wherever you listen to podcasts, they are these shows are available there. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for participating. And you'll have a great weekend. And take care of yourself. And we'll talk to you next time on First Responder Friday.